go. <laughs> Why did you do the introductions? Well, <laughs> welcome everybody to another XPL Alliance podcast. Today we will be talking about the Pirate Canvas. And our guest is Peter Merrill, founder and chief ecosystem officer of XPL Alliance. Hi, Peter. Hey, Stefan. Well, it, I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, I, I think we've got a few people who are interested in Pirate Canvas, and it's one of those subjects where um, uh, the format seems really simple. So there must be some subtlety to the way it gets used, because how difficult can it be? But um, uh, uh, let's start at the start. Uh, I intend that we spend 10, 15 minutes uh, sliding through a deck to make certain everyone's up to speed, and then we can take some questions. Sounds great. Let's go. All right. Well, so for all of these things, we, we, we kind of have a, an epic normal form. Um, and so why, who, how, and what? Why do we want to worry about such a thing as a pirate canvas? Um, when we are bringing new products to market, we experience, hopefully, an initial growth phase. Everything starts going off and everything is good. And then much more often than not, we hit some sort of constraint, uh, a market bottleneck of one form or another. We might not be too clear on what it is. And if we do know what it is, we might not understand why it is. So that's, that's a big part of the motivation. Uh, once the return for uh, building and fielding and operating a product starts to tail off, it's a little bit late to, um, to think about innovating. Uh, if we wait until we get to that um, red end of the sigmoid curve, where um, the return has gone flat, maybe we are not a cost center yet, but we're well on our way, we, it's too late to think about growth. We really need to change our ideas, otherwise we get stuck fielding uh, a product or a feature set and then waiting until uh, it, it's far too late for us to do something significant about it. Really, we want to take more of a, an Apple under Jobs approach to things. Apple these days doesn't seem to have learned the lessons it had learned under Jobs. So um, under Jobs, the idea was all about stacking these return S-curves. Um, and by stacking them, we're able to continue exponential growth uh, in the market and uh, if we do things properly in the organization as well. So if that's the problem we're trying to solve, we, we, we don't want to go flat line and we don't want linear, we want exponential return, then we have to have a way of understanding how to grow our market exponentially. And growing the market exponentially means growing an ecosystem exponentially. Does that make sense so fast of Absolutely. And Apple has been good about that. Right? Mm, I agree. Um, I think that um, uh, they did a, a, an incredible job for, oh, easy 10 years under Jobs. And then their momentum kept them going for a long time under Cook. But I, I don't think we need to go down the Apple bashing path. The fact that their behavior has changed doesn't come as a surprise to anyone. I want to look forward. Um, and in doing this, we have a, a set of metrics that originate with a man named David McClure called the Pirate Metrics. The reason they're called the Pirate Metrics is the acronym for them is R. Uh, and that is to say, um, acquisition. We have to be able to acquire customers. And McClure uh, runs an incubator in San Francisco called 500 Startups. And he came up with these metrics to uh, try and improve the quality of business plans coming across his desk. He said, if your business plan doesn't account for all these metrics, then I, I don't really feel a great need to read it. And um, they, the pirate metrics have become very popular in the growth hacking community. But we make use of them in the context of the theory of constraints. We think about market constraints. So you, if you can't acquire people in the first place, there's very, very little else you can do with them. But once you've acquired them, then the next step is you have to activate them. And McClure gives a beautiful definition of this. He says that to activate them means that you have to get them to identify themselves well enough that in principle, someone, not necessarily them, someone will 
pay you for their behavior as they interact with your ecosystem, with your product. So um, uh, it doesn't make any sense to think that just because someone has spent some time on your website that you've got them activated. If, they, if you're able to put a cookie in their browser and you happen to be a Google, perhaps that's activation. But for most of us, that's not activation. For most of us, uh, we would like to have their credit card details or at least have them subscribe to a list, uh, have them uh, take our app and actually start it up and enter their details um, or authorize their details to be entered. So activation, um, the difference between activation and act acquisition at first seems a little bit subtle. But uh, the more you think about it, the more you realize that it's a, a critical step. It's very easy to lose people on the way from acquisition to activation. Um, I should say on acquisition as well, we're not talking about just, oh, they saw the website. There has to be some actual interaction with our services somehow. Uh, if we're not giving them some kind of benefit, it's not really acquisition either. They need to keep coming back. And if they don't, then we haven't retained them. Uh, if we don't retain them, then they cannot refer other people to us. They, they, they came, they saw, they left. Um, if they came, they saw, and they kept coming back, well, then they'll bring other people with them, and we want to give them ways to do that. Um, we're going to look at two um, commonplace examples of pirate metrics as we start to investigate pirate canvas. Uh, one being Apple and the other being Uber. But, but we'll, we'll come back to the Apple one in just a minute. So once we've got them to somehow bring people in, this is different to acquisition because it's not people coming in uh, fresh. Who, uh, they don't know anyone involved in the ecosystem. They're coming in because they know someone in the ecosystem. And that means we don't have to market to them. We don't have to worry too much about some kind of um, outreach. Instead, it's a viral cycle where the people who are already in drag more people in. So finally, we have to have a way of getting return from them. Um, now, return is not necessarily uh, income. If we were talking about products and services in a public sector, then return could be reduction of risk. In the original Pirate Metrics, McClure talks about revenue rather than return. The return's nice and general, so we can use that. Um, so, Stefan, with these pirate metrics, I mean, you and I have been through this a few times and we've applied it um, a couple of times. So I, I'm wondering whether you feel that there's anything missing in this formulation as far as growing an ecosystem is concerned. It's a good approach from my, my perspective to basically further your, the understanding of your, of your clientele or the people you're working for. Mm. So you're thinking it, it's good in terms of understanding the customer's behavior. Yeah, but as long as you're not fooling yourself. I mean, mm. you have to be careful not to slip into uh, some survivorship bias driven metric analysis. <laughs> that, yes. And, and you end up with something building for the people who already pay you and who have very specific ideas while you're basically ignoring the significantly larger market share that you could yeah. offer. When you want you're, to focus you're bang on, on. more to the left side, right? Yeah, yeah. Because if, if you just go, well, we've got these things taken care of, I can tell you exactly what our product does that makes each of these things work. Uh, you're not really thinking on the left-hand side of the equation. You're not thinking about what's driving people into your ecosystem. And man, that's, that's a, a side of the equation that can change pretty fast. Um, uh, there's a, a good example with um, Uber in China, uh, where Didi um, changed its own referral play so dramatically um, with a campaign they called the Red Envelope campaign that involved uh, every time you took a ride, uh, you would get a red envelope, an electronic red envelope that you could share with somebody else to give them a discount. You couldn't get it yourself. So um, that multiplied Didi's market by a factor of 10 in a month. And so if you're not thinking about the problem space and the drivers, if you're only thinking about your current solution, you can easily find yourself pushed out of the market by someone who thinks more about the left-hand side, which is what happened to Uber in China. And by the way, you're being pushed out of the market despite the fact that all the, the success metrics you picked earlier are 
deep in the in the green, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The right thing. Yeah. Well, that, that's why we picked this picture with the water spouts. If we think of the water spouts as the uh, paths to other people's ecosystems, these are the true unhappy paths. We, we, we have people who bang on the desk and say, oh, it's not doing what the spec says it should do, and that's unhappy. Well, no, it's, it's not. I, I'm not saying that testers are wrong to be worrying about acceptance criteria, but the real unhappy paths are the paths that lead uh, people out of your ecosystem. They're basically leaks. And they're, so their acquisition and activation and so on, they're paths that lead people through this kind of funnel to somewhere else, not in Kansas anymore. Um, so if that's our motivation, that we, we want to be able to move things to the left-hand side, as you say, then who do we have who can figure this out? We live in a world where there's no shortage of product owners. Um, and many of them... Most of them, all of them, I don't know. Certified in courses that have no exams or where no one's ever failed the exam. And um, product owners, once you call someone an owner, they become very attached to that title. We talked to, about this um, last time with leadership as a service, that uh, once you call someone an owner, then other people start to look at them differently. They don't think of them as a peer who's guessing about acceptance criteria and, and priorities. They think of them as some sort of authority, a man in a white coat, and uh, they stop questioning their, their calls. So if a product owner uh, doesn't necessarily do all the homework they need to do, which is almost impossible for them to do, then there's um, not going to be a good outcome. You're not going to get that clear formulation of the constraints in the solution space, the constraints in the design space, the constraints in the business. Uh, without understanding all of those, uh, you're not going to get the kind of outcome you'd like to have. So this brings us to the concept of a product squad. Uh, we, in Lean UX, there's a, 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 a pretty much the same concept called a product team. That's where we got, got the idea from originally. The only difference here is that we are expecting to enroll representatives of all of our technical chapters, uh, everybody who's involved in delivery, we need to get representatives of those people to uh, be involved in a way that um, isn't going to be overpowered or overpowering. We need to get the business stakeholders involved similarly and working as peers and design stakeholders. Now, often it's the business stakeholders who do the overpowering. So there's a very simple practice pattern we use in our product squad, and it's one of the main differentiators between this and a product team. We call it leadership as a service. We went through it last time, so I'm not going to go into any great depth. But suffice to say, it's a decision-making protocol that encourages consensus decision-making and self-organization while still guaranteeing timely decisions. Um, so it's a decision protocol for peers. Um, now, this picture, Stefan, I have to confess, I'm not entirely happy with this picture. Uh, some of it I borrowed from... Uh, some UXD folk, and some of it I've replaced with um, some bits and pieces that make more sense, uh, I think. But uh, this is stuff that um, is still, uh, as a picture, is still being iterated in what we're doing. Um, so don't take it as gospel. Yeah, it's um, but the, overwhelming at the moment. Uh, yeah, it is. It's awful pretty, though. That's why I put it in, because I like pretty pictures. Um, and anyone who wants to uh, step through it and go, well, that bit's wrong, that bit's wrong, that's a bit wrong, uh, we would love the feedback. We are always trying to improve the way we're doing things. The main thing is that we, we're talking about overlapping domains of competence. So if we were to stick an individual in the middle of this and say, right, you do all the talking to everybody on, in all of those bubbles, and they never don't need to talk to each other. They don't need to have the conversations that are described in the intersections. They can just have those conversations with you, and if they, you need to do many, many loops to be able to, to get the different constraints reconciled. You can be uh, secure in the knowledge that as a product owner, you have the final call, so you can short circuit the entire conversation and make whatever call you like, and people won't be able to question you. Well, maybe that's not a very good idea. So getting people to work together as peers, um, actually there's a, 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 there's a law called, it has the unlikely name of Hagbard Cellini's second law. It actually belongs to Robert Anton Wilson. And it goes like this, uh, accurate communication 
is only possible between peers. Um, so that, that's not very encouraging when we look at a lot of our, our command and control hierarchies in the businesses we work with. But part of the motivation in Xscale um, is to get learning to flow across those hierarchies. We're not trying to get rid of them because, well, we're realists, uh, pragmatists. But, um, but in the work that we do, we must be able to get uh, people to talk face to face. And that's, that's a key part of the Agile Manifesto. So how do we get that product squad to work? Uh, I want to start with an example uh, to do with iPhone. But before I do, since I think they have infinite amounts of puff today, Stefan, any questions so far? Not from my side. I think it's an interesting part. Let's go on. Okay, cool. Um, right, so I want to look at um, iPhone in a way that people aren't used to looking at iPhone. Uh, when you hear Johnny Ive talk about iPhone, it's all bevels and bezels and oh, colors and, and, and the look and the feel and the, ooh, touch that bit of glass. Isn't that exciting? Um, no, it's not. I'm sorry. That's, I, I, I'm not saying experience is bad or that product design or industrial design is bad. It's, those, those are important things, but they're not where we start. And it's certainly not where Jobs started when he began to work on bringing iPhone to market. He started in a place that most people don't even think too hard about. Um, he started with the glass and steel and concrete Apple stores. So the reason that he started there was uh, iPod was getting killed in CompUSA um, they, by um, cheap, mainly Chinese knockoffs, nothing to do with China per se, it's just where they came from. But when they did mystery shopping, they found that um, uh, people were coming in and saying, oh, I'm interested in an MP3 player. I've seen these iPod things. Can I play with one? Yes, sir. Here, or oh, madam, here is your iPod to play with. They play with it for a while and they go, oh, that was, that was really good. I really like that. I want to buy this thing. And the salesperson would say, well, it comes in the following price brackets for different amounts of, of, of memory. But, um, but just so you have a, a good, clear distinction between the different offerings, here is a cheap Chinese knockoff. Now, you'll see the experience is nowhere near as nice. It doesn't have the, the bezels and the bevels and so on. But it has just the same quality of playback, and it holds just as many songs, and it only costs half as much. What would you like to buy, sir or madam? <clears throat> and that didn't work out very well. So Apple was about to take a huge risk in bringing the world's most expensive phone to market, uh, and one that was, well, in the words of um, uh, Steve Ballmer, it didn't even have a keyboard. Uh, so in taking a risk like that, it was very easy to get killed in, in, by comparisons in CompUSA. So they had to start building uh, concrete and steel and glass Apple stores. And I might think, wait a second, that's just marketing. That's not designing the product. When you think about all of the engineering that goes into the distribution mechanisms and the, 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 the customer monitoring and training of the the, the, um, uh, the people at the Genius Bar and to say the right things in the right way at the right time and all of the back office stuff that goes on behind the big gray panel where you've got lots of uh, machines moving boxes around to hand them to the geniuses at just the right time and all of the, the systems that track you through the store so that at that moment where you suddenly go, you know, I might think about maybe buying this thing, that's when the salesperson swoops all of those systems required vast amounts of engineering. And to do it without having any real experience of it before and do it from scratch and to make the world's most successful, most expensive per square meter retail outlets, that's engineering. Um, that's design. So, all right, but we, we just made a distinction. We said basically we, we don't want to sell these products to big box stores. That, it's a rule. It's not saying exactly what the Apple stores will be. Uh, who knows what they're going to be. They already had the electronic ones, of course, and all of the, I'm a Mac, I'm a PC, but that's different. So then we've got the play about activation. Everyone remembers the little white cable, the amazing little white cable. No one could believe that a single little white cable could both power the phone and have such huge bandwidth. You could get your entire iTunes library down into the phone in just a few minutes. Um, it, it was really amazing. The very first thing you did when you unboxed your uh, phone, uh, your iPhone, was you, you 
plugged it in and you, you loaded up your iTunes library. Why is that activation? Well, it's activation because your iTunes library comes with your credit card details. And Apple had to jump through hoops of fire to find a telco that would permit them to uh, attach the, the user's credit card to the phone. Um, they gave AT&T this huge sweetheart deal because um, at the time, almost all software that ran on phones was billed through the telco's phone bill. And the telco took 80 to 90, sometimes 95% of the value of the software and the services that, that were billed that way. Um, and that went for paid SMSs and so on as well. So they basically owned the channel. And if they owned the channel, then um, it kept the software developers out. Uh, software developers stayed developing for laptops and desktops, unless there's a way for them to get some proper margins on the phone. Now, the beautiful thing about this activation was that it allowed Apple to take a market that was paying them pennies for songs and turn it into the same size market that was paying them hundreds of dollars for phones. So effectively multiplying the value of what was a large market by a factor of 10,000 and suddenly overnight they were, became the, the most valuable company on the planet. And that's not too surprising given that play. And it all comes down to the little white cable. So again, it's design, but not design of the experience. You could have had uh, lots of different kinds of experience uh, there. You could have downloaded it wirelessly. It was the, the need for activation that made that happen. Then on the retention, and everybody thinks, oh, great. Well, the big distinction for iPhone was that really magical experience of touching the internet through the screen um, that we all take for granted now. Uh, when Jobs was first promoting it, oh, it sounded like the sexiest thing ever. Um, but that, that's, that screen by itself, that idea that oh, once I've got an iPhone, I'm not going to go back. Well, that's a form of retention. But a more important form of retention was that once you had gone and played with it, you wanted to play with it again. So this is what got people coming back to the Apple stores over and over again. Their kids going, Daddy, I want to play Flappy Birds or Angry Birds, or whatever kind of birds it was, over and over and over again. Um, so it was a, a little circus experience. And uh, that ability to come and entertain your kids for a couple of hours with some free Wi-Fi and a free uh, prototype iPhone, well, that's retention. People keep coming back into your ecosystem, even if they haven't bought anything yet. They, you haven't got to the return part of this. They're coming back. Um, and so obviously they were leveraging a lot of the other channels they had to make the same thing happen. But uh, that was the, the, the key draw of the screen. Yes, it was also that once you used one, you went, oh, I don't really want to go back to my Blackberry. I don't think I can face those chiclet keys. But um, the big deal was that once people played with one, they wanted to play with it again. And they would go to where they could play with it again. And that put all of the Apple products in front of their faces. So then uh, on the referral end, gee, Apple was very nice giving us iMessage. I wonder why that was a free app that Apple put together. Well, the reason is a referral reason. The initial iPhones were bought by people who were high net worth individuals. And uh, when it came Christmas time, they all went through the same decision process. And the decision process went like this. Um, gee, you know, little Johnny wants to play with my phone. I really ought to get him one of his own. But gee, they're expensive. I could get him something, you know, a cheap MP3 player or something. I saw a Chinese knockoff in Comp USA. Um, well, wait a second. I spend hundreds on little Johnny's or little Jill's SMSs every year. If I got little Johnny or little Jill an iPhone, it would pay for itself inside of a year. Oh, they'll love it. So, um, so that referral play. That was a conscious choice on Apple's part. That's why they shipped that app as one of the first suite of apps. Um, the same thing goes for Find My Friends. Uh, with Find My Friends, well, speaking as a parent, I've never had to worry about where my child is. I don't think my child even thinks that I'm snooping on them. I don't really need to snoop on them I, I, unless there was something amiss. Um, I always know where they are. For them, it's just natural that I know where they are. They grow up that way. So there's no big brother or big daddy about it. 
So that, again, this is all plays to get people who have lashed out on something for themselves to go, oh, I've got to get the rest of my family onto this. So then on the return end, pretty obviously, yes, App Store obsoleted the software retailing industry. And you might think that that was a, a huge money spinner for Apple. And you might be, well, you are dead wrong. Compared to what they were making on the hardware, it was peanuts. The reason that they did it, the return they got, was it brought massive developer mind share in. And with the developers came channels for different people's ecosystems, all running over the same Apple infrastructure. So um, kidnapping or uh, capturing other people's uh, software ecosystems was the point. By giving the developers um, a much easier, cleaner, and more remunerative path to market, uh, Apple wound up capturing a very broad and diverse selection of other people's ecosystems. So this is a very weird way to think about um, design. And I don't want to go down the design path because um, I want to think about this very generally. We are designing ecosystems, but they might be learning ecosystems. So uh, uh, to give a, a, a vague uh, example about this, actually, before I go on, Stefan, um, anything you'd like to add before I go on? You're doing a wonderful job, Peter. Just go on. <laughs> I'm wide awake today. Um, okay, so bicycles. Um, uh, when I was a kid, they came with training wheels. Uh, it was Christmas time. I had a bicycle under the, the tree. Uh, yay, I can ride it immediately because it's got training wheels on it. Um, in point of fact, it's not the best way to teach a kid to ride a bicycle. Uh, the best way is to take the pedals off and let them learn how to balance. And then once they've got the balancing skills, once they can do a couple of turns just by leaning, then you put the pedals back on and they can ride almost immediately. Uh, training wheels, in a way, uh, stop people from learning to balance. So they, they actually make it harder. Nevertheless, um, little Johnny acquires, or I acquire, somebody acquires, uh, a, a, um, a bicycle with these training wheels and eventually learns to take how to ride with them off. So this is acquisition and then activation. But activation of what? They already had the bike. This is a learning ecosystem. So uh, what's happened is the learning ecosystem of biking skills has acquired little Johnny. Little Johnny is now able to ride around on his bike. And uh, in fact, if you tell little Johnny that uh, he's only allowed to play video games for an hour every week, or something like that, um, well, you'll very soon see little Johnny riding around his bicycle regularly, and that's retention. Little Johnny has some friends, uh, little Jill, and, uh, and demonstrates to little Jill how to ride. Pretty soon, little Jill wants a bike too. But as little Johnny takes the, um, the pedals off of little Jill's bike, that's where referral is going on. It's referral in a learning ecosystem. And then, well, when little Johnny gets a little bit bigger and uh, uh, he and little Jill start scooting around town on a moped, uh, then we've got some return on the learning. The return is the ability to learn more things. Once you've got the balancing skills, you don't need to worry about cracking up on your moped. Well, there might be some other reasons why you crack up on a moped. Um, so this idea of uh, pirate metrics and ecosystems, that's a really neat idea. Um, but Stefan's problem at the start, taking it to the left, that's where um, a different idea comes in. And this is an idea we get from a man named Goiko Adzik. Uh, as far as I know, Goiko hasn't had anything to do with Dave McClure. And if he has, uh, I haven't seen this idea from him. I really wanted it, so I went, okay, well, let's just make a simple matrix. We'll have the pirate matrix across the top. And now this why, who, how, what, what does why mean here? Why means, what is the business driver? What is the problem that we're trying to solve? Uh, what sucks? Who's, whose behavior has to change to solve the suckage? How does their behavior have to change? And then what do we have to do or deliver to cause that change in behavior? And that's all ADZIC. Um, so in starting with, with uh, what sucks, we don't necessarily have a breadth first view of what we need to do to grow the ecosystem. So 
uh, by combining impact mapping, the why, who, how, what stuff, with the R, we're able to approach the ecosystem, the growth of the ecosystem generally. And we don't have to worry about things falling through the cracks. And we can also question um, the validity of the assumptions of the stakeholders as we go. We can try and quantify them as we go. When we go from a why to a who, or a who to a how, or a how to a what, we are making assumptions. And now ask questions about how do you quantify that assumption? How do you know that who is the right person? That, that, that changing the behavior that way, that how is the right way. That delivering this thing is going to cause that change in behavior. We can test these things scientifically. And that's where the pirate canvas comes in. This is really the first important practice pattern in product management for a product squad. So in the first example, well, I guess it's the second example because we kind of looked at this approach with Apple. We just didn't look at it very systematically in terms of why, who, how, what. Well, now we're going to look at it in terms of Uber. Um, so with Uber, we have um, uh, something that everyone, well, I guess just like iPhone, everyone understands uh, uh, what Uber does, but not everyone knows where it started. Um, there were these two guys, uh, Travis Kalanick and the other guy's name, I never remember because he's not the one who made the papers. Um, and they had both had successful startups and they were standing on a street corner in Paris, having just attended a startup conference in 2008. Um, and it was snowing on them. And they were trying to catch a cab and they couldn't catch a cab. And they were trying to, to catch a limo because they kept seeing these limos scoot by with these very elegantly coiffed uh, ladies and elegantly coiffed gentlemen. Um, and uh, obviously the most limos that you see scoot by are pretty empty because swell elegant after all. And they're waving cash at them saying, we will help you with the fame. You, you, you can have this limo for free. We'll just, just pick us up. And it wasn't working. But as they were waving their cash, they realized that, oh, this is actually a really good idea. We could have, start up, have a startup around this. And they went back to San Francisco with an idea for a limo sharing service. And that's what they started trying to market. They actually started driving limos to get an experience of it in a lean startup kind of a mode. Um, and as they drove around, they eventually, after a lot of feedback, they eventually went, oh, we miss the wood for the trees. We, we, there's a much bigger idea here in ride sharing than we had thought. Well, okay, how do we get at that big idea? So we're going to spend five minutes looking at how they might have. This is not what they did. Um, but this is an example of applying the pirate canvas. So um, when it comes to taxi sucking, why does acquisition, why does getting a taxi suck? Well, if there aren't any on the street or if you are driving a taxi, and there's no passengers on the city street. Well, that sucks. You can't, you can't um, activate any of the rest of uh, the commercial aspect of what you do without matching supply and demand. Um, on activation, well, uh, often you'll call for a cab and it won't come for 10 minutes. And you call up the dispatcher and they say, oh, it'll be there in 10 minutes. And in fact, they'll never tell you it's not coming because then they wouldn't get paid. So they will keep hoping that it will come eventually. Um, so, uh, likewise, if you're driving a cab and you, you get a call to go and pick this person up, well, most of the time they've already picked up the first cab that was available to them and they're not there. So that means you have to go back to a uh, rank and wait on a rank. And all of that waiting is costing you time and it's also costing the passengers time and in general activation, actually getting the ride to happen sucks. Um, on the retention end, well, I think we've all had bad experiences in cabs, especially if we've driven cabs and we've had passengers throwing up and doing other things we don't like in our cab. So either way, we have no way of preventing poor service. Um, on the referral end, let's say that you are an excellent cab driver and you give a very good service and you, you always give out your business card, but with a sinking feeling in your heart because you know that... Um, uh, the passenger is very unlikely to ever call you again, even if you gave them great service, because you're probably going to be in a different part of town. Um, and anyway, they, they, they're in a hurry and they can't remember where you, they put your card, but they, they have an app on their phone and it just goes through central dispatch. <sighs> so referral sucks. And then on the return end, well, 
uh, everyone who drives a cab has to have special signage and special insurance and that means extra on-road costs and the on-road costs have to be passed on to the passengers so cabs are expensive and that means that uh, the return uh, on the investment that both the passengers and the drivers and for that matter the owners of the cabs are making uh, that sucks too so I don't want to go through this entire matrix um, I want to go through just one of these if we look at the return one because I think everything else is pretty obvious to everyone um, on-road costs are bad and uh, so we have to change the behavior of the industry regulators to change those okay how well, we don't want them to have to have. We don't want to have to have special insurance to be able to to share a, a ride with someone we don't know. Uh, okay. Well, what makes their behaviour change? That's a pretty good question. A very diverse set of features to do with um, political lobbying, uh, legal action, uh, brown paper bags full of cash turning up on the right people's desks. I don't know that Uber or Lyft or whoever does their business using brown paper bags full of cash. But if I were doing it, I would certainly consider it because uh, I'm simply trying to look at what's going to be the most effective feature that I can bring that's going to generate this change in behavior in this stakeholder to address this business driver. Now, is that really the stakeholder whose behavior I want to change? Maybe there's another way to do it. Uh, maybe if we were changing the way that it's policed, even if the law was there, it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, maybe when it comes to, yes, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the, the police we've decided to change. Well, then uh, how do we want them to change, to change their behavior? Uh, we would like it to be, uh, we would like there to be a, a, a gentle uh, a, a warning system rather than someone getting a heavy fine. So changing the behavior and figuring out whose behavior to change and for that matter, figuring out really what is the problem with on-road costs, it might turn out that actually it's the amount of time the cars are on the road that um, if we are using a broad fleet of um, private cars that, that we don't have all the maintenance costs we have in, in mechanical repairs, which of these is it? Well, we need the numbers. So the key aspect, there are two key aspects to using a powered canvas. One is we want to make the assumptions explicit so that we can question them and consider alternatives. We can do this as we go uh, from why down to who, who down to how. Every time we go a level layer lower, we can um, question whether one or another of these alternatives can be eliminated with analytics or subject matter expertise and then go and acquire those things. It might cost us money to do so, but nowhere near as much money as delivering the wrong product or the wrong feature set at the, right, at the wrong time. Oh, Stefan, I think I'm not going to go through where this plays in the X scale patterns because it would be nice to use at least some of the time to, um, to take some questions. That is a good idea. Gideon, yes. are there any questions on your side? I think we've lost Helen. We had her before. Yes, yeah, she was asking for a recording. So oh, well, happily she'll get one. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not certain whether Gideon's got any questions at the moment. I'm going to assume he doesn't because we don't have any. So, um, oh, no. oh, ah, he does have a question for learning. Um, so I, I, I guess you mean um, to do with uh, growing a, a learning ecosystem. But um, ask me something more specific, Gideon, because I'm not certain um, just what the question is. You may as well put him on the air, uh, Stefan. It's good to go. Okay, Gideon, you can Hello. talk if you... Hello. Hey, wow. Hello. I'm alive. All right. Uh, yes. So uh, regarding a, a learning ecosystem, can, yes. you, can you put that more in context for a pirate canvas? Yes, so, I can. Yes. I've, uh, I'm well aware of how to do this for product, but it's uh, good to get it from a different perspective in the cool. learning space. Um, all right. So... Uh, 
I originally thought of this when I was trying to map um, transformations to uh, an epic landscape, because really the output we're getting here, if we think of why, who, how, what is the normal form, plus acceptance criteria and analytics as the normal form for an epic, then I went, well, I'd like to have change epics that describe the transformation that we're going to be delivering so that we can uh, systematically break them down into change features. We can think of change or learning as the product and the organization as the market. So the bicycle riding example I gave before, um, it, it, we can think that uh, the people who we expect to become our change participants, well, we have to acquire them. And um, last week when we were doing the, um, uh, the, the uh, Seven Samurai Kanban, we were looking at how we use open space and portfolio council to acquire them. Uh, well, actually, I guess portfolio council is more activating them because what we, we want is once we have acquired them, uh, they are enrolled in the change program, well, now we have to have ways for them to participate. And the retention part is that we, we don't want them to just give us input at the start and then somehow magically we're going to deliver a, a transformation, we'll run a bunch of training and great, you've got it now, bye-bye now. Um, that's not going to work. So when we are looking at the, the three aspects, business, technical and design with the learning ecosystem, the business stakeholders are our change owners, the people who, who brought the coaches and trainers into to do the work. And the technical stakeholders, these are the people who know about the actual constraints. These are the change participants themselves. And I, 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 last week we talked about why we talked about change participants rather than recipients. Um, but uh, uh, the idea is we want to be servant leaders for the change rather than pushing the change. We want to provide um, perspective and practice patterns that will solve the specific needs of the people who are going to be involved, whether they are part of the initial steel thread of change or off to the side, um, we, we may need to represent them in this little portfolio council, which is really a, a product squad for change. Um, and then the design stakeholders, well, that's us. We, we know a lot about designing and delivering change programs. So it's basically um, the portfolio council becomes a, a product squad for uh, learning as a product delivered to the organization as a market. So I was going through the pirate metrics before. Uh, referral, well, in self-propagating transformation, we want the change participants to become change leaders. That's the way we did this back when Agile started, it worked just fine then. Otherwise, it would never have matured to the point where some people would have started calling themselves trainers and said that you can't possibly learn how to, to, to convey this deep knowledge unless you are some sort of official trainer. That's poppycock. Uh, the coaches are very good at delivering training as part of a coherent change program. And so the referral part of this is basically a handoff where the coaches are no longer the servant leaders but the people who are in the capability, you know, who are doing the uncompromised agile value stream, design, delivery, and DevOps all hooked together, when we split that stream in half and new change participants who have trust relationships with the old ones join, that's referral. Now, the people who are doing the do continue doing it, and the newcomers learn by immersion, the same as if they were visiting their friends in France and had to immerse in the French language and French culture. You know, they pick it up really quickly and because they're working with people they trust, um, they have much less anxiety about learning it. It just happens quicker, better, cheaper, uh, safer, because it's less risky to do it that way. So uh, that's the referral end. And then on the return end, well, the reason why we run change programs is because we want to increase the rate at which learning occurs in an organization. But if it occurs is too weak a word. If we think of the way learning moves through the organization, the flow of learning, we want to increase that. Um, so uh, let's see, another question. An example of one epic pirate canvas. Uh, okay, that's a, a good question. Um, let me dig out something um, I'm not free to, to 
to reveal it. I'll have to describe it. Um, it's one I'm working on at the moment with um, Urshad Nizami. Um, uh, and it has to do, oh, for learning. Oh, okay. So then, again, I'm not free to share it yet. Um, uh, Minton Brooks and I are doing one for his work in ESI. Um, but I'm hoping to have those as case studies uh, a little bit later in the year. So um, I'd say um, hold on those questions. But um, I do want to share them. Maybe what we'll do is we'll, we'll get the names filed off and we will uh, then share them directly um, and publish them uh, on the, in the usual places, uh, xklives.org and um, uh, xkl.wiki, I should say. We've now got it integrated, so xklives.org. We need to have a, a, um, a use case, sorry, a, a case study section there. For that matter, we need to have a podcast section there, or at least a video section. Um, so it's coming. Ooh, thank you for thanking me. Okay, so... Um, Anything else? Stefan, how about no, no, you? I'm okay. Then let's call this a successful webinar. Okay, all good. Peter, all right, fellas. Thank, thanks a lot for your time. Thank and you. We're going to have another one next week, probably. Ah, yes. And we already know what the topic is because uh, we've had a number of requests for this. So. We, um, we had a conversation going on this week on LinkedIn with uh, Daniel Mezik, and it led to us um, uh, uh, having a chat in the Stewards Council and, and relaxing one of the constraints on the licensing for the Xscale Blueprint. So it's now a proper open content license. It's just BYSA. There's no more NC on it. And so that led to a bunch of people saying, gee, that um, Blueprint diagram, um, we really like to, which is the stuff that I was looking at here. Uh, let me go back a little bit. Um, this stuff. We'd really like to understand oops, what all of that's about. Um, so mm -hmm. next week, we are going to do um, an overview of the X-Scale Blueprint for Agile Organizations to put uh, all the stuff we've been talking about into um, a breadth first context and we'll use um, the um, actual live X scale blueprint to walk through it. So that's the idea. Outstanding, Peter. That'll, that'll be fun. I'm looking forward. I think it will too. Cool. Awesome. No worries, Stefan. Talk to you All right. Take care. See you then. Bye.